Hello there and welcome back to a new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. We finished five chapters so far and today we're entering into the sixth chapter of this series where we are talking about how to believe or about the science of faith or the science of renewing your mind. And the first subchapter from this big chapter is entitled, We Received All the Faith. We'll talk about the fact and prove based on the Bible that the believer or the born again Christian has received all the faith of God at the moment of salvation. We just need to learn how to work it out and to release it. And the Bible says that, that we receive the same gift of Christ, everything that God is potentially and the same full measure of faith in our inner spirit, in our new recreated spirit. We receive the whole fullness of God. And it is the same measure for everybody that comes into Christ, the same measure of faith at the moment of salvation. And we, from there on forward, we are to learn how to release more and more of that faith from the spirit through the mind, into the physical body and to the outward world, to the external world, until we actualize everything that Christ is or put flesh to Christ inside us, we put flesh to, to, to Christ. Christ. Christ comes out of us. Jesus Christ comes out of us. And if you have your Bibles ready, let's begin by reading the first passage, uh, first passage from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but you are welcome to use any English translation you have available. Let's read it together. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Apostle Peter here addresses to all, he talks to all those believers that receive the same kind of precious faith as they did. So all believers have obtained like precious uh, faith as the apostles had. The faith that the apostles had, we have as believers in Christ. The same kind, the same uh, kind of faith. Then Ephesians 4 verse 7 says this, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And actually this verse is rendered better in other translations as according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Every believer was given grace according to the proportion or the measure of Christ. It says, to, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. How big is Christ? A gift, uh, according to the measure of gift, which is Christ. Christ is the gift. Every Christian has the whole measure of Christ inside of them. They just need to activate it and make it work. Make it work outside. Christ is in us, in its, in its fullness. Jesus Christ is actually in us. The moment we come in the family of God with all the faith, with all the power, and we need to learn how to release that faith and power on the outside. So we have all the faith. Moreover, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In this passage, Many Christians believe that the gift of God that it talks about refers only to grace and not to faith. However, I believe both grace and faith are the gift of God. Why? Because we've seen previously in 2 Peter 1 verse 1, it says that we obtain the precious faith, the same precious faith by the righteousness of our God. We obtained it from God. We didn't work it out ourselves. We obtain the faith from God. So both grace and the faith are a gift, the gift from God. 
When someone hears the message of the gospel, the Holy Spirit tries to convince that person of sin and bring conviction of faith from the outside because the, the unbeliever in Christ has, uh, doesn't have the, his spirit recreated yet. So the Holy Spirit comes on the person and tries to convince the person and bring faith into the person from the outside. But the moment that person receives Christ inside, the Holy Spirit recreates the human spirit into a spirit of faith. And from that moment onward, the spirit of faith inside of the believer will generate faith when we hear the word of God. It will generate it from the inside this time, not from the outside. Let's read one more passage from 2 Corinthians 4.13. It says this, And since we have the same spirit of faith, According to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Did you see what this passage says? We have the same spirit of faith. I, I want us to notice two things in this passage. First, the new recreated spirit is a spirit of faith as it is a spirit of holiness, of power, of love, of self-control. That recreated spirit is a spirit of faith. It generates faith. The new spirit has all the faith of God himself. Can you believe that? That faith that created the world is inside of us. We have the whole faith of God inside of us, locked inside of us. Second, the second thing I want us to notice is that all believers have the same spirit of faith. The same faith. Amen? And one more passage in, the, in this subject. Galatians 2 verse 20. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see here what it says? The believer lives by the faith of the Son of God Himself. His faith, you live by His faith. You have His faith in you, His kind of faith. So in other words, you have the God kind of faith in you. You have the faith of God Himself in you. That's what Paul is saying here. He's no longer living, we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. And the life that we live now in the body, in the flesh, we live with the help of the faith of God in us, the faith of the Son of God in us, which is in us. That's extraordinary. That's powerful that we have the same faith that God has. We have the same Spirit of God that generates faith and helps us. Romans 12 verse 3. I'm reading this time from the King James, the old King James Version. Let's read it together. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. That's why I'm reading from Old King James Version, because here it says, God dealt the measure of faith, the same measure of faith, not a measure of faith. God has given every believer the same and the whole measure of faith at the moment of salvation. Think about this. If we have been dealt different measures of faith at the moment of salvation, then some of us will have good reasons to think highly, more highly of themselves than others because they receive more faith than others. But since we received, uh, everybody received the same measure of faith, then nobody has any reason to think high, more highly of themselves than others. And that's exactly what Apostle Paul is trying to say here. Guys, don't think more highly of yourselves than others because you have received the same measure as everybody else. You're supposed to think soberly of yourselves based on the fact that God dealt to every man the measure of faith, the same measure of faith. Amen? So every believer has faith. The initial release of faith is smaller from, the, from our inside to the outside because it's related mostly to what Jesus has done in the past at the cross. 
that he took away our sins and to the future life the fact that you escaped hell and you're on your way to heaven that's usually the level of knowledge and revelation you have at the beginning in the beginning when you receive salvation it's a limited knowledge so that's why you have limited release of faith because faith is based on the knowledge of the word of god however that faith is released more and more as you grow in christ by knowledge of the word by worship by fasting by prayer and by exercising that faith and exercising the word of god and the church is always involved in a war between the kingdom of god and the kingdom of darkness although jesus won the war at the cross once and for all we are still involved in the fight of faith as believers we are still involved in enforcing what jesus did at the cross sickness is an enemy we need to destroy so that's why although jesus won the war he gave the devil a, a final blow once and for all the devil is defeated but he left us to put all his enemies under his feet he left us to fight the fight of faith in the world and to enforce the victory that jesus did at the cross amen and i'll give an example here from the united states although slavery in the united states was abolished uh, at one point uh, and the law decree was given there were still pockets of resistance that needed to be crushed and it took almost 100 years until that law became a reality everywhere so the law was given but it took 100 years for people to actually enter into the reality of that law because the the uh, the slave master uh, masters continued to abuse their slaves although the law was given and the slaves some of the slaves didn't even know for a long time about that law and even when they knew about it they were too fearful some of them to rise up and to stand and to even die for that law to be free to say to take to to tell their masters i'm no longer your slave from from this day forward i am free that's what the law says because if they said that then the masses would kill some of them so it was although the war was won by that law decree and all slaves became free in one day uh, the that law to be enforced in the reality of the day-to-day -day life it took 100 years it took longer time and that's the same thing that it happens that happened at the cross and happens with us believers today in the new testament in the new creation era that's what we're supposed to do to enforce the victory from the cross uh, against the devil and to advance the kingdom of god and to destroy sickness everywhere we see it to rise up the to raise the dead to cl to cleanse the lepers to cast out devils to deliver people and to enforce jesus's victory amen so we received all the faith that we need we just need to activate it the second sub chapter that uh, i want to talk about today in this big chapter uh, on the science of faith is it's entitled the progressive release of faith how does this faith get released more and more on the outside and the bible talks about little faith and great faith or about weak faith and strong faith and let's see what are these terms what is little faith great faith weak faith strong faith little faith versus great faith i believe it can refer to the level of knowledge revelation and understanding of the word of god in your mind in your conscious mind how much do you know about your inheritance in christ based on your knowledge of the son of god your faith can be limited to just a few areas of your life you can have knowledge only on in certain areas of the spiritual life and based on that knowledge according to that knowledge your faith can be more uh, limited more limited or more extended amen for instance you could have greater faith in the area of finances or money because you heard a lot of teaching on the subject but less faith in the area of healing because you didn't uh, you didn't hear a lot of teaching on healing or you don't know too much about it and your faith is limited in its release because of the knowledge that is in your mind on that subject the knowledge from the word of god now weak faith 
versus strong faith can refer to how established you are in the knowledge that you have and how strong is the conviction and the confidence you have in the truth of God that you possess. You possess a level of knowledge of the word of God. You possess a level of truth. And that's uh, what little and great faith refers to. But then weak and strong faith refers to how strong, how convicted you are in your inner man, in your unconscious mind, in your heart and spirit, how convinced you are of that word of truth that you possess. And the faith is really stronger or weaker depending on that conviction. And now, I, and today I'll, uh, I'll cover and I'll talk a little bit more about the science behind faith and about the brain, about the heart, what, is, what does the heart consist of, about the soul, about the spirit. So the heart consists of the unconscious part of your mind, of my mind, uh, or the subconscious, and of the spirit. The heart of a, a person is comprised of the subconscious and the spirit. They work together. It's somewhere here. It's the, the heart is the gut, the intuition, the gut of a person, the, the subconscious of a person, the subconscious mind. And the heart is like a court of law where multiple weaknesses testify to your heart before a conviction or faith is formed on a subject. It's like a court of law. Multiple witnesses are saying their testimony and, be, uh, uh, and then the judge, the heart, decides and forms a conviction on a subject, a belief on a subject. And this is one, one reason why the Holy Spirit, when he, when he comes into the believer, he is called the helper. He is one of the witnesses, the inner witnesses to, the, to our heart. He testifies about the word of God. And the main two witnesses in the believer's heart are, one, the physical body with its five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, uh, touching. The physical body with uh, the five senses, it records the external reality and that recording goes into the heart. It's a, wit is a witness to your heart. And that reality forms a lot of our beliefs. It's a very strong witness. The, our five senses are a strong witness. And the second witness is the inner witness of the Holy Spirit that we receive at the moment of salvation. Other witnesses to our heart can be past experiences, good or bad, that had an impact on us, on our minds. Or people that you trust and you receive input from them. They can witness to your heart and you can believe them and form beliefs on different subjects based on what they say or based on, on some ne past negative experiences that you had or good experiences all your life. As long as you live, you are forming beliefs on different subjects in your heart without you even realizing that. As you go, you form beliefs and you are not conscious of all of them, but you form them based on all the witnesses that are testifying to your heart. Amen. And when you hear the word of God, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit testifies to your heart, to your subconscious mind, that what you hear is the word of God. That's why when you hear the word of God, something in you tells you that it's the truth, that you should believe it. Because there is a inner witness. And we need that because the word of God and the kingdom of God are unseen. They are not accessible through our five senses. The, the word of God doesn't appeal to the witness of the senses. It doesn't come through the witness of the senses. The first main witness uh, to our heart is unseen. We cannot see it, touch it, or hear it, or smell it the word of God and the unseen reality. So we need another witness in our heart as powerful as the five senses to counteract, counteract the five senses and to witness and to create faith in our hearts so the word of God, so the power of God can flow through us. The people in the Old Testament, 
that followed God, like Noah and Enoch, uh, Abraham, Moses, and the people of Israel in general, they didn't have the inner witness in the recreated spirit. So to them, you'll notice that God spoke more through visible and audible ways, which appeal to the witness of their five senses in order for them to believe him. So God spoke through their five senses so that they would believe him. He, he, were, he appeared to them in the cloud, to the people of Israel. He spoke audibly to, to, to Abraham. He spoke through dreams. So he, he used different ways because those people didn't have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. So they needed something more tangible that would witness to their hearts so that they would believe God. Let's see one more passage about faith in Romans 10, verse 17. How does faith come? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, what is the word of God or the word of Christ or the word of grace? They are all equivalents. They are equivalent expressions. What is the word of Christ that produces faith when you hear it? Have you, have you ever wondered that? What is the word of God? What is the word of Christ? It's, is the Bible everything that's written in the Bible? Yes and no. The word of God consists mainly of all the laws that God has decreed and that he put in place in the spiritual realm and which apply to you and me as a new creation. That's the core of of the word of God or the word of Christ that produces faith in our heart. That's the word of God in the new creation era or time period. I'll repeat again, the word of God or the word of Christ consists of all the laws that God has decreed or promises and he put in place in the spiritual unseen realm and, the, and which apply to us as new creations. That is what the word of Christ is. And this refers to all the promises that God has spoken about us and which have effect here on earth. Amen. That includes what? Peace, joy, prosperity, blessing, healing, victory, success, favor, Whenever you hear a sermon or a teaching, if it hasn't produced faith in you, like confidence, hope, joy, boldness, it was not the word of God. Because whenever the word of God is preached, now I'm not talking about just reading the Bible. I'm talking about preaching the word of God, which I mentioned before. What is it? It always produces faith, joy, and boldness in your heart. When you leave church, when you leave that place, you are more emboldened to take the kingdom of God, to advance the kingdom of God, to conquer over darkness, to destroy all the enemies of Jesus Christ and of the kingdom of God. Amen? Now we saw what is the word of God that produces faith. Now let's see what is faith. And I'll give a definition here. Faith, it's a complete conviction in the heart about the things that God has spoken about you and me and that apply to us in his word. Again, faith is a complete conviction, a full persuasion of the heart about the things that God has spoken about us and that apply to us in his word. It's a confidence and a boldness in the unseen reality of us in the truth about ourselves, about our new creation. We have to be more convinced about the spiritual reality than what we see and feel, what we hear, what we touch, what we taste, what we smell. When we hear the word of God, the inner witness of the recreated spirit testifies to the heart about the authenticity of the word, about the genuineness of the word. And then the heart becomes convicted and our whole mind, conscious and unconscious, aligns itself to the spirit inside. If you remember, I mentioned it a few sessions back that truth has a certain thing to it, has a certain sound. Whenever you hear it, you know that it's truth. How does that happen? 
through the inner weakness that testifies to your inner gut that what you hear is truth. What you hear is the word of God. That's how it happens. Let's read Jude chapter 1. It's only one chapter, verse 20. The Bible says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. What is your most holy faith? The whole faith that you received of the moment of salvation in your spirit, inside of you. Then you build yourself, meaning mainly your mind, your conscious mind, your unconscious mind. You build that mind to align itself with the spirit and the faith inside, your most holy faith inside of you, so that more faith and power is released through you. That's how you build when you pray in the Holy Spirit, when you pray in tongues. You remove all the blockages uh, from your mind and you allow the Holy Spirit to speak through your mouth that you hear back into your mind and to testify to your heart, to convince your heart about the Word of God that you know, that you heard, that you ever heard. This is powerful. This is so exciting. I, I'm so exciting. First Peter 5 verse 10. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. You see, the God of all grace, who called us, he is the one perfecting us, establishing us, strengthening us, and settling us. So there's a process, there's a, a progress of the release of faith. There is an establishment, a strengthening, a settling on the word of God and on faith. One more passage, Galatians chapter 4 verse 19. My little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, says Paul. So there's a forming, there's a time in which Christ takes form in us, comes out of us. I'll, and I'll give an example here. How many of you know that there's a big difference between learning theoretically how to drive a car and actually doing it? You know, in the beginning, when you, begin, when you start learning to drive a car, it takes a little bit more effort from your side to learn to drive a car because you have to be conscious of a lot of things in the same time and you're not accustomed to those things and it's a little bit more effort on our side but as time goes by you'll notice that it becomes easier and uh, at a certain point you're not even conscious anymore that you're driving a car it becomes part of you what happens the knowledge of driving a car goes from your conscious mind to your unconscious mind where it becomes an automatic pilot, like a habit that you're not even conscious anymore. It takes control out of you. It becomes part of you. It's a knowledge, not just the knowledge of the mind. You are aware how to drive a car. You learn from a book how to drive a car, but it's a practical knowledge. It's an experiential knowledge that, that you have to how to drive a car based on practice, based on living it. So that's what, in the same way, we need to do with the Word of God. We don't just need to be aware of what the Word of God says, but it has to become part of us, part of who we are by practicing it, by living it out. We, have, we get that knowledge, that practical, experiential knowledge on which faith is based. And the Word of God needs to go from your conscious mind to your unconscious mind to your heart where the beliefs are formed amen the same applies to musical instruments it's one thing for someone to tell you how to play piano or guitar and actually doing it try try to uh, hear to play a piano or a guitar if you don't if you have never played try to play it you will see it's impossible you need to take your time you need to practice you need to learn and take it slow that is how we make the Word of God part of ourselves. And that's how we begin to live the miraculous life, the supernatural life that God has given us in Christ Jesus. This is our inheritance. 
We always need to become perfected, established, strengthened, and settled in our minds and hearts according to the spirit of faith that is inside of us. The word of God is already settled in heaven, as we mentioned in previous sessions, in the unseen realm. We just need to settle it on earth. But in order to settle it on earth, we need to settle it first in our minds, in our unconscious minds, in our hearts. Amen? And faith comes and flows freely by hearing the word of God and filling yourself up with it on a regular basis. Faith is strengthened by saying the word of God, meditating on it, acting on it on a regular basis. It's very important to think about the word and we'll see why. To speak the word, to personalize all those passages, all those verses that apply directly to you as a new creation. Because when you speak it, your, your ears, your five senses hear it and it goes to your heart, to your mind. In the beginning you speak in order to believe more and after a while you speak because you have already begun to believe more. You speak out of belief. So in the beginning you speak to believe and then you speak because you believe. So it becomes the word of God becomes part of you. Let's read Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 to 15. And to see this growth, this forming, how it takes place. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the, for the equipping of the saints for the work of, mini, of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the, uni, to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, treachery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. What does this passage say? It says that God has given to the church teachers and pastors and apostle, prophets, evangelists to equip the saints to work on their knowledge of faith, to help them in their faith, to help them come to the unity of faith. Pastors and teachers, they are just helpers to the body of Christ. They are also believers first and foremost. They need to learn how to have faith and how to believe uh, themselves for themselves as well as the, all the other believers they need to be ec experts before other people that's why they are helpers who are the coaches in soccer or in baseball people that that play all their life and they know that game uh, both theoretically and practically and then they coach other people but their coaching is has their coaching has more power because they have experiential knowledge. They lived the game. They played the game. So the same is with pastors and teachers, evangelists, apostles, prophets. It's not their title that gives them more faith. They need to believe like any other believer. They need to take the word of God in them and believe and then be helping others, help other believers to get the same knowledge, the same faith into them and then do the ministry. What is the ministry? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils, teach, uh, prophesy, uh, deliver people, take the strongholds out, the, the wrong beliefs out of the people's mind. That's ministry. Love people, encourage them, comfort them, prophesy to them. That's what ministry is. And that's the role of these helpers in the body of Christ. It seems there is a unified and consistent body of faith to which all believers must arrive. I'm not sure if they will arrive in this life, but we tend to that. There's a consistent body of faith. Faith is not ambiguous or vague. There is a unity of faith in the spiritual realm. There is clarity how the spiritual laws work, what applies to us, what it doesn't apply to us, how to have faith, and the spiritual world knows exactly how all things work. We need to come to that knowledge by the Spirit of God on how things work and not on how not to be anymore in confusion and not to know how things work and to be taken by surprise by the devil and not to be aware of his devices, of his strategies. 
but by the Holy Spirit and with the help of the of uh, pastors and teachers and evangelists, we come, we we tend to grow into that unity of faith. And in this process, we all have pieces and gaps that need to be filled and corrected. We are to put flesh to the Christ inside of us and build it into a perfect man. Build Christ from inside of us into a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Do you see how power, what, what powerful words are used here? We need to arrive here on earth to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ himself. Amen. This is awesome. We are to grow into him and he is fully inside of us in our spirit, but then our minds grow into him. So this is what I wanted to say about how we release faith. And now in the third subchapter, I want to talk a little bit more about the science of mind renewal and brain, the brain's neuroplasticity and everything that I'm, I'm going to tell from here on in this subchapter is taken from Dr. Carolyn Leaf, who did a great job on explaining the brain, explaining the mind, explaining how the mind is renewed and can be renewed, the science of thoughts. And I, I took some of her ideas and put it here because it makes perfect sense with the Bible, with what the Bible says and actually brings Christianity and our spiritual life to, to a level where it's no longer metaphorical, symbolical, something nice and good to have. It's power and it's something real that affects our day-to-day -day lives. And God made provision for us so that we will not be disadvantaged. We will not be on our own. We have so much. We were given so much by our God, our Father. And we should not be afraid of science. Because science and spirituality ultimately, eventually, will never contradict. Amen? Because science will prove what God has already did, what God has put in place. Science catches up with what God has already put in place, both in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm. In fact, science already explains a lot of things from the Bible. And the latest research, the last couple of years, especially on the brain and the mind, explain God even more. The science catches up now with, with what, what God is and what the Bible says, and actually proves what the Bible says more and more. God designed us to be able to change our brains. Until a few years ago, the science world believed that we cannot change our brains. Whatever we are born with, we need to work with it and deal with it, and in many cases, medicate that brain. However, now they discovered that we control our brain. Our brain does not control us. We are not a victim of our biology or how we are born. They say that as a normal human being, without Christ, as a human being, we cannot control the events and the circumstances of our life, but we can control the reactions to those events and circumstances. And as a Christian, we know that we can also control circumstances of our life from the realm of the Spirit. Not any particular situation, but we can make sure that we live only in success, in favor. Nothing negative takes us by surprise. Even if it takes us by surprise, we know we can overcome it. So from that point of view, as a Christian, we can control the circumstances of our life and the events of our lives. The more we grow in faith. Because we, we realize that all things work together for our good and we live in that state of faith, in, in that plane of life that is a wonder for other people. You become a mystery. We become a mystery. And as a Christian, we can control those circumstances. But this is what neuroplasticity is. This is a new term from the latest research of scientists. The brain's ability to reorganize itself by forming new neural connections throughout life. And I'll say it again. Neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to reorganize itself by forming new neural connections throughout life. For instance, if you hear news that a lot of people are getting sick with Alzheimer and you receive a thought of fear that you might get Alzheimer as well, 
just by receiving the thought and meditating on it, you increase your chances of actually getting it with 65%, more than 50%. Can you imagine that? This is what Dr. Carolyn Leaf says. This is, this is what scientists say today. If you also speak it out, that thought, then you increase your chances of getting it even greater. Recent research shows that 98%, 98% of cancer causes start in the thought life. That's extraordinary. That's amazing. And only 2% are biological, purely biological. 98% of the cancer causes start in the thought life. You hear someone had cancer. You hear your, your father and mother had cancer. That means you will have it too. You will get it too. And you allow that thought and fear in your mind. And that thought and fear, if you also talk it out with your friends, with your family, or with your doctor, then it actually, you increase your chances of generating that sickness in you as well because of your thought life. Every word that you speak, now the science uh, has entered more and more into the quantum physics. There is a quantum world out there, quantum speeds, and you will hear more and more. Uh, quantum physics is not, it's different than the normal physics that we learned at school. It's very different. So every word that you speak is a quantum package of energy. Your words are full of energy, spiritual energy, both positive and negative. That's what they are discovering now. This is not a new age weird stuff that you might have heard. The new agers have been doing this for years. They were smarter than us Christians, but they stole it from God without them even knowing, or maybe they knew it. You can use some of the powers of creation without being a Christian, but when you become a Christian as well and use those principles correctly, then it brings God's glory. It brings glory to God. So don't be afraid of science. When you become God's son or daughter, you also receive Christ's authority to function in that spiritual realm. And way more power through the Holy Spirit. Now you have a legal right through Christ to function in the spiritual realm. Those new agers, they don't have a legal right. They are, they are under the dominion of darkness. They are under the authority of darkness. They have limited power or no power at all, if we really think it through. We have all the power through the Holy Spirit, through Christ. We have all authority, both in the spiritual realm and the physical realm. That's amazing. And we are so unaware. So many of us are unaware of what we have in Christ, in the spiritual world. Without God, I want to make a difference now between the New Agers and us Christians, even if we use some of the same principles. Without God, those principles work only for a season and then they collapse. It doesn't last. But with God, they last. They are more powerful, more accurate. And it's time to take back what the New Agers, the Buddhists, the secret advocates. I don't know if you heard about the book, The Secret, or the, the documentary, The Secret. I heard. You can look it up online. So we need to take back what the secret advocates have used for years to their advantage, but without God. They used it without God, but we have also God. And God has put some laws in creation that we need to use as well. The brain houses the result of the mind. That's what Dr. Caroline Leaf says. It cannot generate a mind. They are two separate things. The mind is with one foot in the physical world. As I said, I took it from here. Through the brain is one foot in the, uh, in the physical world and another foot in the spiritual quantum world through the recreated spirit. So with the brain, we interact with the world. Through our spirit, we interact with the unseen world, with the spiritual realm. So we are in both worlds. These worlds and are intertwined. They are in the, occupy the same space. One is unseen, one is seen. But we live in both worlds in the same time and we control the physical world from the unseen world. 
through the Holy Spirit, through the recreated spirit. The human person is a triune being made up of spirit, soul, and body. And maybe you heard that before. The spirit, what is the spirit? Is that place of intuition, of gut, of communion and fellowship, is that place of conscience. That's what the spirit is. The, this science is uh, what the, this delimitation between spirit, soul, and body. Uh, we do some delimitations, but they we, we don't know for sure where exactly is the limit. This is approximate uh, delimitation. So the spirit is the place of intuition, the place where we commune with God, we fellowship with God, with the spiritual world, and the place where we have God has placed the conscience. Then the soul is made of, of intellect, reason, emotions, and free will. Actually, the soul is the mind both conscious and unconscious. And then the body is the physical stuff, substance that we can see. So we are spirit, soul, and body, but our, our self, our whole personality is mainly the spirit. And then is, the, uh, is housed by the soul and the body. And the mind, which is the soul, consists, as I said, of a conscious mind and the unconscious mind, which, is, which can be called also the subconscious. Uh, some people make a difference between unconscious and subconscious, but I'll put it in one category. And if you want to dig deeper, you are welcome to do that. And the unconscious mind or the subconscious runs 99.9% .9 of our lives. Can you believe that? 99.9% .9 of our lives. And it has storage space, memory storage space for 3 million years. When I heard that, I said... Oh man, I was worried that I'm getting old, that I will not be able to retain as much as I did in my youth. You see these thoughts that are coming from the human world, from the physical world, from people's opinion. And in actuality, you have storage space for your memory for 3 million years to storage all the video, everything that comes through your senses. And from that moment on, I started believing something else. No, until my you know, older years, until the end of my life, my mind will be a sound mind. I will be able to retain. I will have a good memory because I have. I was created with so much space, so much space to retain so many things. So don't worry that your neurons will de deteriorate, will be destroyed the more you learn or retain. Learn as much as you can all your life. You can learn any time in your life because actually when you learn something new, you keep your mind into shape, your brain into shape. You exercise your brain. And the more you do that, the more you'll be able to do it later in life. So you can be sound, you can learn, you can do doctorate, you can do masters even in, uh, in your later years in life. So never say, I hear people up there in their 40s or their 50s, Oh, I'm old. I am old. Man, you're not old. You're just starting your life. Now you can have leverage with all the experience that you gathered in 50 years or 40 years. Now you should have more leverage and you should know more. You have more insight. And the more you learn, you're more experienced. You can help more people. Never say you're too old. If you say that, it affects your mind and you're getting older because you're thinking that and you're saying that and you're speaking it out out of a belief that you are actually old. And that affects your body and we'll see how. The conscious mind is awake only during the day, but the unconscious mind is awake 24-7 all the time. Your subconscious is active. Because the spirit world is always active. That's why. And you, you are with one foot in the spiritual world. You deposit or plant thoughts in the subconscious mind through the conscious mind. And then the subconscious mind controls everything, takes over. There it's the place where you form habits or automatic pilots. The conscious mind does 2,000 actions per second while the unconscious mind functions at a whole new quantum level with quantum speeds of over 400 billions, billion actions per second. This is way greater than the speed of light or the speed of sound. It's unnatural. Nobody can reproduce this kind of speed. 
400 billion actions per second. No CPU in the world, no processor uh, can do this speed. It's, uh, that's why we say it's uh, quantum levels. It's spiritual. It's something outside of this world. That's how our subconscious mind works. With 400 billion actions per second, can you imagine that? How beautifully God created us. The conscious mind can be aware at the same time of only about 47 things, but the unconscious mind much more, the subconscious. The emotions and feelings are under the control of the subconscious mind. And actually the flow or the, the order is the following. The thoughts in your conscious mind and your words go to the unconscious mind, into the heart, or, and then in there they generate the corresponding feelings either of joy, peace, and love, or anxiety, unrest, worry, and fear. So our thoughts, what we speak, go into the heart, in the subconscious, and they generate feelings. That's why after you gossip, or after you talk negative things, you will start feeling depressed, you will start feeling anxious, fearful, um, unrest, uh, worry. The more you talk negatively, it will affect your emotions. But the more you decide to talk positively, to, to speak the word of God, to worship God, to focus on the kingdom of God, then the feelings, if they, are not, if they, if they were not there in the first place, they will begin being generated, the feelings of joy, of peace, of boldness, of faith. That's why during worship, when you listen to the word of God, after you listen, you leave that place more emboldened, more full of faith, because your feelings begin to react to what you hear, to what you put through your conscious mind. That's extraordinary. Let's move forward. The neurons, I have a little bit more about this science, which is amazing to me. The neurons in your brain look like branches in a tree. As you listen to me even right now, you form new branches in your mind and proteins that hold the information as temporary memory. Thoughts have substance in your brain through proteins. So thoughts have substance in your brain through proteins and they retain temporary, it's a temporary memory. You retain this information that I'm saying now. That is how you remember some of the stuff that you heard. Then if you refresh that information long enough or act on it, practice it, there are some special cells who will slowly carry that information into the subconscious mind, into unconscious mind, where the long-term memory is and where the belief system is, where it's formed. I was saying it. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, 10, that with the heart, someone believes. That is a subconscious mind and the spirit. So there are these cells who carry the information from the temporary memory to the long-term memory. So there's actual substance to renewing your mind, to your thoughts. And when we allow thoughts of fear, anxiety, worry, stress in our conscious mind, they also generate branches and proteins, but toxic to the brain. When our spirit was recreated in Christ, in 1 Corinthians 5, 17 says that, we were made perfect and complete. Colossians 2, 9, 10 says this. Let's read it. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It says about Christ. And you and me are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So we were made complete. We were designed by love and for love. Actually, the Bible says in Romans 5 that the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that we receive. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive all the love of God is in, in us. We just need to manifest it. So we were created for love. We were designed to function in the love zone, which is eternal life, joy, and peace. We were designed even from the beginning, but much more in the new creation to be addicted to love. If I, I may use this term. This is our default mode of operation in our spirits. This is the normal way we should function as Christians, as new creations. But we still have 
wrong programming of the unconscious mind from our own nature with toxic thoughts and feelings. We have a wrong programming of the heart from before we were born again. We have wrong habits, wrong beliefs, wrong uh, thoughts in our long-term memory. The body cannot handle toxicity in the brain for long. That is why it gets sick. The body gets sick when you have toxic thoughts in your brain. You may last for a while, but it, you will not last for long because toxic thoughts will sicken the body. Our thoughts affect our body and our cells. There's a science be behind this. When you worship God and pray in tongues, you release joy, peace, you move into the love zone and you increase your capacity for miraculous. You increase your capacity for the supernatural. You get in sync with the spiritual quantum world, with the spiritual unseen world. You get in sync when you worship. Actually, you, you come into that zone where your feelings are peace, love, joy, and you function more naturally as you were designed. That's why miracles happen. That's why you have more faith after you worship, after you pray. Because you come and function to the normal level as you were supposed to function as the son of, and daughter of God. 1 Corinthians 6.17 says this, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Can you believe that? The Holy Spirit is one with the human spirit, is connected to the human spirit. And the human spirit communicates directly with our unconscious mind towards the conscious mind. And then to the body and to the outside world. Your spirit can control your soul and your soul controls your body. The body does the will of the soul and of the spirit if we, if we don't let it do whatever it wants. Thoughts precede words and actions. Your thought life precedes your words and your actions. What you think, you will speak. What you think, you will believe, you will speak and you will act and then you will believe it more. But it starts in your conscious mind, in your thoughts. I think I'll stop here today because we covered a lot of things. There is much more that I have prepared on this science, on this uh, topic of the brain and how the mind is renewed. But I don't want to rush into it. I don't want to mess it up. I want us to assimilate uh, the whole teaching. So I will continue in the next session with more exciting stuff while I will uh, reiterate some of the things that I said today so that it will get into our hearts and that we will learn it. And until we see each other next time, I pray that God will bless you and give you more favor, more revelation, more insight and help you get established, settled in faith. In the name of Jesus, amen.